let's let's take our break at this point. All right, Mr. Uh, Merrill, you can step down. You're ordered to come back in 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take our mid-afternoon recess. Remember all my admonitions to you. We'll stand in recess for 15 minutes. The um, duffel bag behind my shoulder, behind my back. Yes. Behind my back. Thank you. Now, at the time that you saw him carrying this, sir, was it empty like this? No. It appeared to be full? Yes, it appeared to have one suit in it. Could you tell if it had one or two suits in it? Oh, uh, hard to tell. And with respect to this duffel bag, was it empty like it is now? No. It appeared to be full? Yes. Is there any other bag that he was carrying, sir? Those were the only two that he had with him when he got off the plane, that I recall. When he came towards you after he got off the flight, he was, you met him at the gate, correct? I met him as he exited the plane. Okay, you watched him walk toward you? Yes. Did he appear to limp? Um, not that I noticed. I noticed that he was, had a little bow-legged, but that's about it. Okay, that's, that, I mean, I'm not talking about the shape of his legs. Right. I'm just saying, the manner in which he walked. N no, I didn't notice a limp. Did he appear to be grimacing in pain as he carried the uh, garment bag over his right shoulder and the duffel bag in his left hand? Not that I remember, no. When you first met with him, you shook hands, correct? Yes. Shook his right hand? Shook his right hand. And his left hand was gripping the duffel bag? Right. Right. He put the garment bag uh, into his left hand. Okay. So you could not see his left hand as it was obscured carrying the duffel bag? At that point, yes. And then you went over to the baggage claim area, correct? Correct. You sat next to each other? Yes. What side of him did you sit on? If you I recall? sat on his left side. Okay. And when you were sitting on his left side, you were speaking to him and you were looking at him. Is that correct? That's correct. Were you looking down to look at what his left hand was doing? No. I wasn't focusing on the left hand. No. Okay. And people came over to ask for his autograph, correct? Correct. And he signed with what hand? With his right hand. If I remember correct. Now, he interacted with each of those people that asked for his autograph? Yes, he did. How long did he interact with each of those people? Oh, uh, maybe 30 seconds mm -hmm. each. Right. Just long enough to say, hi, sign. Right. How are you? There was a few other pe few people that lingered longer, but that's about it. And during that time, sir, you were in an airport, correct? That's correct. Lots of people around. Actually, I've never seen O'Hare uh, as unfull as I did at that point. Okay. It was awful early. But you said 15 to 20 people came up to him? Yes. Okay. So there were at least 15 or 20 people around? Oh, yeah. Okay. Were there more than that around? Yes. Can you estimate for us how many people were around? In the baggage claim area itself? Oh, boy. Uh, maybe 75? Okay. 100? Okay. It's a guesstimate. So 75 to 100 people were around at the time, correct? Correct. He's a celebrity, isn't that right? Yes. And he was a spokesperson for Hearst Corporation, correct? That's correct. And he's one of the celebrities that you advertise as being in the golf tournament. It's a draw for your company, isn't That's it? That's right. right. And spokespeople are paid to be affable and charming and look good, present a good public image on behalf of Hertz, aren't they? Yes. That's his job, correct? Correct. And if he didn't do that, he wouldn't be very good, would he? Oh, sustain. Now, when you were at the baggage claim area, you sat there for, you said, about 10 minutes? Approximately, yes. And during that time, people were coming up, asking for autographs, et cetera, correct? Correct. And basically, were they coming up and doing that for the entire 10 minutes that you were with him? Yeah, basically from the point we sat down. Okay. So you really didn't have any time alone with him. Is that a fair statement? Not at that point, no. Now, when the baggage um, arrived on the carousel, mm -hmm. uh, what, was, what was it that he picked up from that area? Um, he walked over and picked up the golf bag. And was that the only item that came? That was the only item I saw. Um, I was carrying his other bags. Mm -hmm. I, did, I just noticed the big black golf bag. And when you say that you were carrying the other bags, what other bags were you carrying? I was carrying the garment bag and the duffel bag. Okay, when you say the garment bag, you refer to people, uh, Defense 1065, the one I just showed you, the black garment bag? Correct. 
and the duffel bag, the black one I just showed you, Defense 1064. Correct. You did not see any small, dark knapsack type bag? Uh, I did not. And you said that the defendant picked up the golf club, sir? Yes. He didn't ask for you to do it? No. You ever picked up golf clubs before, sir? Many times. You play golf? Yes, I do. Not very good, but I play. Pardon? Not very good, but I play. All right, I'd like for you to pick up this golf club for me. <clears throat> Tell us how heavy that is. Let's say 25, 30 pounds, maybe more. Can you pick it up? Can you tell us how the defendant carried it on uh, June the 13th, 1994? <clears throat> he put it on his back and carried it out the door. Do you have that strap over his shoulder? Yes. Now that particular bag, sir, it's been marked, hasn't it? Yes, this is the uh, Swiss Army brand. That's 1063? 1063. Of the three bags that you've described, that golf bag there, sir, and the garment bag, 1065, and the duffel bag, 1064, which one was the heaviest? I would say the duffel bag. The duffel bag was the, the heaviest? Best of my, best of my memory. The, the heaviest of three bags? Yes. Oh, well, the golf bag. Okay. So the defendant carried the heaviest bag, is that right? That's correct. And when he carried that bag, he carried it out to your car? Yes. How far was your car from where you, he picked up the golf bag at the carousel? Oh, I would say 50, well, 75 to 100 feet. 75 to 100 feet he carried that golf bag? Yes. Did he limp during the carrying of that golf bag? Not that I noticed, no. Did he complain about pain in his arms or his shoulder as he carried that golf bag 75 to 100 feet? No. And did he put that golf bag into the trunk of the car? He handed it to uh, Bombay, who, who helped him put it in the, in the trunk. So there was someone standing by there ready to load up the luggage into the trunk? Correct. But the defendant carried that golf bag by himself without asking for your assistance. That's correct. And he gave you the lighter bags to carry, correct? Uh, he didn't give them to me. I picked them up as he, as he walked up to the carousel. Because he went to pick up the golf clubs himself? Correct. Didn't ask you to do that? Carry um, the golf clubs? No. No. All right, now you've indicated uh, you drove him to the hotel, is that correct? That's correct. You were driving? I was driving. So you were not watching him, you were watching the road, is that a fair statement? Yes. And there was a third person in the car, Shah Bombay? No. It was just the two of you? It was just he and I. Okay. And you had the radio on? It wasn't blaring, but yes, it was on. I mean, you, there was music on? Yes. You were listening to music? That's correct. All right. So were you trying to uh, see if he had any injuries to his hands, his face, cuts or bruises? Uh, no. You had no idea that there had been two murders committed the night before? I had, absolutely no. Absolutely and you no. had no reason to believe that he was injured for any reason at that time? No. So as you were driving the car, and I presume watching the road, correct? That's correct. You had very limited opportunity to observe his hands or his face. Would that be a fair statement? Well, sustained. It's vague. Rephrase the question. It's also right. compound. You were driving the car and you were watching the road. Is that a fair statement? That's correct. Were you looking to see whether he, the details of his hands, his fingers, or his face? It is. Okay. I'm sorry. Were you looking to see the details of his fingers? No. Were you looking to see if he was injured? No. Now, I think you were um, asked by Mr. Douglas whether you recall seeing a Louis Vuitton garment bag in his possession that day? Correct. How big is a garment bag usually, sir? Um, well, it depends on what you buy. Um, some of them are large, can be four feet, three and a half to four feet in length, and others are short, uh, basically the size of a, 
of a coat, of a jacket. And, and the length of a jacket, what, was that about two, three feet? Approximately, yes. All right. So the smallest it could be would be about three feet. Would that be a fair statement? Sure, in length. Yes. And you said you did not recall seeing a Louis Vuitton garment bag in the defendant's possession on that day? Not that I recall, no. And you also did not recall seeing any cuts or bruises on the defendant's hand that day? That's correct. Now I'm going to show you a photograph that Mr. Douglas showed you. Carl, do you have it? Oh, it's there. That is, is it one twenty three? All right, sir, we're showing you one people's one twenty three again. Let me ask you a couple questions about that. First of all, the cut that you see there, do you think it's as long as an inch? It looks like it, yes. Could it be as small as half an inch? Um he's got pretty big hands, I don't mm -hmm. know. Maybe. Now, if you didn't notice a garment bag that's at least three feet high, mm -hmm. do you think you would notice a little half-inch cut on somebody's finger? Sustain. Let me ask you something else then, sir. This photograph that you see before you here was taken in the afternoon of June the 13th. Mm -hmm. Looking at this photograph, can you tell us whether that is the reopened cut that had been suffered on June the 12th? Well, I'm not a doctor. I, I sustained foundation. All right, you can't tell us whether there were any cuts on his finger on June the 12th, just that you didn't see any, correct? That's correct. You indicated he called you again then in the morning of uh, June the 13th. After you dropped him off at the hotel, you heard back from him again at 825 Chicago time, correct? That's, that's correct. That would have been 625 California time. Is correct. that right? Correct. And how long was it after you dropped him off that you got that first call? Oh, approximately two hours. And how long did you speak to him that first time? That first time was very short, 15 seconds. Let me back up for a minute, sir. When mm -hmm. you were at the airport with the defendant, um, you said all those people came over and asked for his autograph. Did he uh, show any difficulty in signing the autographs? Not that I saw, no. And this uh, golf tournament, uh, this is part, was this part of his contract? Is this an obligation that he had to Hertz Corporation? No obligation. Sustain. If you know, sir, is it, was the defendant back in June of 94 uh, under contract with Hertz Corporation? I'm really not sure. Oh, well. <coughs> you can ask I, the question. Um, I assume so. I assume so. That's, that's really out of my uh, hands. Is the appearance at golf, that uh, annual golf tournament mm. an obligation that he has to Hertz Corporation to the best of your knowledge? To the best of my knowledge, I would say yes.
All right, I'm sorry. Uh, the first phone call you had with the defendant at, six, at uh, 825, he called you on your cell phone? On my cellular phone. How long was that telephone conversation? Uh, 15 seconds. And the second call was how long? A little longer, maybe 30 seconds. All right, and the third call, you said it was about a minute, correct? Right. Yeah, about a minute. And it's approximate. Right? Approximately. Okay. You said that the defendant was increasingly sounding frantic and desperate and upset. That's correct. The defendant is an actor, is he not, sir? Argument Rephrase the question. Do you know that the defendant has been in various movies? Yes. And you've seen him in those movies, have you not? I've seen a few. Okay. And you've seen him on television, haven't you? Yes. He's an actor by profession, is he not? Yes. Had you ever seen the defendant before that day, sir? Never. Except on TV. Except on TV, right. right. Not on a personal level, correct? No. You have no way of knowing whether the frantic and desperate manner in which he behaved was an act or for real, do you? Oh, real. I have no way of knowing, no. And would you not, let me ask you something, sir. If a man whose ex-wife had just been killed was acting nonchalant and blasé, wouldn't you find that suspicious? Judge an argument. Sustain. <clears throat> you, sp you spoke to him again on June the 14th? Correct. And he called you? Yes, he did. Where did he call you? He called me at my office in uh, Des Plaines, Illinois. Now, you had never met him before June the 13th, is that correct? That's correct. Did it strike you as odd that he called you back on June the 14th? In a way, yes. Mr. Merrill, what city is your office in? Why don't you spell that for the court reporter, please? Sure. D E S, capital P L A I N E S. Thank you. Sure. I hope I got that right. Nothing further. Thank you, Ms. Merrill. All right, Mr. Douglas, any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Merrill, you, would you de have described your interaction with Mr. Simpson before dropping him off at the hotel as pleasant? Yes. Objection, leading. Sustained. How would you describe your interaction with Mr. Simpson prior to your dropping him off at the hotel? It was pleasant, relaxed. Had he been short with you? No. Had he been rude to you? Not at all, no. Had he showed any anger towards you? No. Had he rushed you? No. Had he shown any impatience towards you at all? No. When Mr. Simpson called you after you dropped him off at the hotel, was he short? Very. Was he impatient? Yes. Was he insistent of you? Yes. Was he rushing you? Very, yes. Was he calling you repeatedly? Yes. When Mr. Simpson called you the next day, he apologized for his brusqueness, didn't he? Yes, he did. He apologized for having rushing you, didn't he? Yes, he did. When he spoke with you on the 13th, did he tell you why he was so short? He, I had asked the question. Sustain. When Mr. Simpson called and apologized on the next day, did he offer an explanation as to his 
unusual conduct the prior day? He basically. Yes, sustained. He wasn't as short with you on the 14th as he had been when he spoke to you on the phone, the 13th. I think, we got, he, I think we got the point that he called to apologize. Thank you, Your Honor. Now, golf tournaments that Hertz gives frequently have executives attend. Yes. There are celebrities that also come. Yes. And it is expected that the participants will then play a round of golf. That's correct. Hertz solicits the, assistant, the assistance of others to help the celebrities and the other attendees. Yes. They have caddies to help on the golf course. That's correct. They have assistance to yes, pick up. Leading. Sustained. Do they have assistance to pick up the luggage from the cars? Yes. When we, when we arrive uh, at the outings, there's always people there to remove the bags and set them up on the cars. So you just basically go in and have fun. So when Mr. Simpson placed the golf clubs into your car at the airport, mm -hmm. that probably would have been the last time that he touched those bags himself. That's speculation. Sustained. Oh, what's the practice of Hertz? Does the practice of Hertz have their corporate spokesperson reach into the trunk to pull out his own golf bag? Objection. Irrelevant. Calls for speculation. Or will. You may answer. No. What is the practice of Hertz? Uh, the, well, it depends on the golf course, but we want our people to show up and not have to do any work, to have some fun. Uh, we have people that will meet them curbside to pull the, the, the uh, golf clubs out of the bag if need be, and, and set them up on the car. And that is true of participants in the tournament? Correct. And that's certainly true of the primary spokesperson who is attending? Absolutely. Now, there were several occasions when you were with Mr. Simpson as he was interacting with others? Yes. He would sign autographs? Yes. He would sign autographs? Would he sign autographs by holding something in his hand? Well, he would have to hold a piece of paper in his hand, obviously, to write it. So there'd be the opportunity for you to watch the, the, the act of his signing the autographs? Yes. Was there ever an occasion when you consciously averted your eyes from watching his hands as he was signing autographs? Uh, I was watching a lot of things. Okay. You didn't ignore his hands, did you? No, I did not. But there was nothing about his hands that drew any attention to you? Rephrase the question. Sure. Was there anything about his hands that drew your attention? Uh, just the fact that they're big. Yep. You did notice that, that he has pretty large hands? Yes. You watched him shaking hands? Yes. You watched him signing? Yes. You saw no cuts? I saw no Jackson cuts. Leading. All right, the answer will stand because it's testimony we previously heard. Hint. One moment, Your Honor. Sir, in that June 14th phone call in which the defendant apologized to you, mm -hmm. you'd never met him before June the 13th, is that right? That's correct. You were not buddies? No. You didn't know him anything? No. He didn't know you anything? Um, no. Right. Apology was nice. It was nice, but not expected, was it? No. You were pretty surprised by that, weren't you? Yes. And a man whose ex-wife has just been murdered calls to apologize for, to you for being impatient. Didn't that strike you as a little odd? I agree with I, yes, I guess. And he also talked to you about picking up his golf clubs in that same conversation, is that correct? I, yes, we did have the conversation. It was initiated by me, however. 
And then he followed it up, though, asked you a couple questions about it, didn't he? Uh, I told him that I wasn't able to get the golf clubs on that flight and that they did go on the following flight. And I offered the, uh, the information on the baggage claim ticket. Actually, didn't you actually tell him you were sorry that you couldn't get them to the airport on time, but that you'd sent them? Yes. And then he asked, no, are they being... And you asked if you'd gotten them, and he said, no, are they being delivered? Isn't that right? He, he had asked whether they were being delivered, at, if, whether I had made arrangements for them to be delivered after they had arrived in L.A., and I told him, no, mm -hmm. I, I, I got them to L.A., and that was basically all I did. Mm -hmm. And that was on the afternoon of June the 14th? On the 14th, correct. And do you know whether he immediately left his house and went to pick them up? I have sustained. All right, now, you indicated it seemed odd that someone who didn't know you would call to apologize the following day under those trying circumstances for being impatient. Yes, Correct? Sustained. It's foundational. Okay. But that's the third time we've heard the question. As someone who saw the defendant immediately before and immediately after the discovery of the murders, your testimony about his demeanor would be very important. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, well. Yes. And he would have an interest in being very nice to someone whose testimony could be so important to him. I have nothing further. He called you, Mr. Merrill, to apologize to you, correct? And ask an answer. Oh, well. Give me an answer. Correct. And then you told him about the arrangements that you had made for his golf bag, correct? Correct. Nothing further. Ms. Clark? I'm nothing further. Mr. Merrill, thank you very much, sir. You're excused. Thank you. All right, why don't you take your cup with you there so we don't mix them up. <laughs> All right, and Mr. Uh, Douglas, you have some exhibits up here that Mr. Merrill has. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Shapiro, who is your next witness? Thank you very much, Your Honor. With the court's permission, we'd like to call Mr. Raymond Kilduff. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the last name. Raymond Kilduff, K-I-L-D-U-F-F. -F. And Ms. Clark, can we grab the golf bag here? Mr. Wooden, would you grab that for us, please? Uh, yes. Ms. Clark, Mr. Packer. All right, Mr. Kilduff, good afternoon. Would you stand right there, please, and face Mrs. Robertson, the clerk? Raise your right hand, please. Raise your right hand. You do solemnly swear to 
I'm sorry, spelling of my name, K-I-L-D-U-F-F. -F. All right, would you uh, just sit back and pull the microphone close to you there, please? Thank you. Mr. Shapiro. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, Mr. Kildar. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. You've been waiting for two days to get on the witness stand here. Yes, I have. We apologize for the delays. You are from Chicago? Yes. And uh, are you employed there? Yes, I am. What is your employment, sir? The Hertz Corporation. Were you employed in the Hertz Corporation on June the 13th of 1994? Yes. Is that date of any particular significance to you? Yes, it is. And what is the significance? It was the date that uh, Mr. Simpson came to town for the golf tournament. And what is what was your uh, job at Hertz on the 13th? Division Vice President, Central Division Sales. And what does that uh, consist of? It consists of, um, I handle 17 states uh, for the sales, the corporate side of the business. Um, in this particular case, we bring in our corporate customers from that area to a golf outing annually. And did you have a particular duty in bringing customers to the outing? Yes, I did. And what was your duty on that morning? Basically, ultimately, I'm responsible for um, it all coming together. And did you... Uh have occasion to be in the area of a hotel where your guests were staying? Yes, I did. What hotel is that? The O'Hare Plaza. At some time in the morning, did you see uh, Mr. O.J. Simpson there? Yes, I did. Where was he when you first saw him? Sitting outside on a bench. What time was it? Approximately about 8.45 to 8.50, somewhere in there. Would you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how he appeared? When I drove up, I saw Mr. Simpson sitting out there. I was surprised, one, because I thought he was asleep. Um, he was obviously distraught. Once I pulled up, his hands were in his, put his hands in his face, like there was something wrong. Um, I walked out, got out of the car first, went up, introduced myself. I had met Mr. Simpson two times prior and um, told him I was from the Hertz Corporation, asked if he remembered me, and at that point, um, he stated he needed to get to the airport. And did you respond to him after he said, I need to get to the airport? Yes, I did. At the same time, though, I had three individuals with me. Uh, John Johnson, who's my boss, Jack Raynard, who's a customer, and Jim Hoy, who is a customer. John got out of the car and said, uh, Juice, what's going on? Sustain. The people that were in your car, did they get out of the car? Yes, they did. And did anyone approach Mr. Simpson? Yes, they did. And did, was there some conversation? Yes. Did Mr. Simpson respond in any way? Yes. Do you recall what his response was? Yes, he said. Objection. Sustain. Do you recall what his demeanor was when he responded? Was this to Mr. Johnson? Yes. What was his demeanor? Upset. What was his tone? Frantic. And at that time, was, did you make an offer to Mr. Simpson? Yes, I did. And what was that? To take him to the airport. Oh, world. What was the offer? To take him to the airport. And did he respond? Yes. What was his response? He asked me to take him. Sustain. Did he get in the vehicle? Yes. What part of the vehicle did he get in? Passenger front seat. And you were the driver? Yes. Was there anyone else in the vehicle? No. How far uh, did you take him to the airport? Yes, I did. And did you ascertain what flight he was on? Yes. And did you make uh, any calls to see what time that flight would be taking off? Two. One, two. OK, you made okay. two calls. Mm -hmm. And after making those calls, did you ascertain whether or not you'd be able to make an earlier flight? than Mr. Simpson had scheduled? I was not aware of any earlier flight Mr. Simpson had scheduled. What flight uh, were you trying to make? 915. Were you able to make that flight? Yes. 
On the way to the airport, would you describe Mr. Simpson's demeanor? Very much the same, very upset. What was his tone of voice in the car? Upset. Was he making any type of sounds? Yes. What type of sounds was he making? Oh. He was moaning. Basically, he repeated uh, a statement several times. Did that statement express some type of distress? Sustain. What did that uh, statement uh, convey to you? Sustain. Did you have an occasion to uh, observe anything unusual about uh, Mr. Simpson's hands? Yes. And what did you observe? That it was cut and bleeding. Which hand did you observe that on? Do you recall? Yes. Which the hand left. was that? Did you notice any type of uh, bandage on that hand? Yes. What type of bandage did you notice? It was a regular, you know, uh, type of Band-Aid. I'm not sure. And would you describe to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury the hand, the bandage, and the blood that you observed? When I, Mr. Simpson was sitting against the, the, the wall, it was very sunny. I could actually see into the bandage because it was loose and it was very bloody. I could see the entire gauze area covered in blood. Did you uh, get Mr. Simpson to the airport? Yes. And did he leave your presence? Yes. Were you contacted uh, by anyone? Who were the first people to contact you regarding what you observed regarding Mr. Simpson? Uh, the Chicago police. And when did they contact you? The Three days later, I believe how, the 16th. How many people, uh, did you talk to someone eventually? At the Chicago police? Yes, the L.A. PD. And how many people did you talk to? Two. And for how long a period of time did you talk to them? About 45 minutes. And did you tell them substantially what you've told us here and told the jury today? Not in this detail. Did you later talk to uh, anyone from police departments? Uh, yes, Mr. Hodgman, and I believe he had five or six policemen with him. Five or six policemen? Yes. Where was this? in my offices. So Mr. Hodgman came to Chicago with five or six police? Correct. It was a mixture of Chicago and, and LAPD. And did you have an interview with them? Yes, I did. did with Mr. Hodgman. Did Mr. Hodgman tape record this interview? Not to my knowledge. Were notes taken of this interview? Yes. And did you explain uh, to Mr. Hodgman and the five or six police officers uh, what occurred and what yes. your observations were? Yes, I did. And was that substantially what you've told this jury? Very close. Have you seen a report that was prepared as a result of that interview? Yes, I have. And in that report, did that summarize what your statements were to this jury today? As a summary, yes. Thank you. Nothing further. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dart. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I'm sorry, what is your position with Hertz Corporation? Division Vice President, Central Division Sales. And you're responsible for sales uh, over how many states? 17. So you're an executive with Hertz? Yes. And the defendant here was the spokesperson for, for Hertz? Yes. Okay. Have you had any meetings at Hertz about your test at Hertz about your testifying in this case? No, not one. Not meetings. I've had conversations. Have you had conversations with uh, your higher ups? Yes. Hertz Corporation is concerned about its image, isn't that correct? Objection. Irrelevant. Or world. Or world. Yes. And Mr. Simpson is the spokesperson for your company, right? Mr. Simpson was. If I understand your testimony correctly, Mr. Kilduff, when you drove up to the hotel that morning, the defendant was seated outside. Is that correct? That's correct. And when you first saw him, his hands weren't up to his face, were they? When I first saw him, at some point, no, I don't believe they were. 
Okay. At some point, though, while I was driving, and I don't remember exactly when, he did put his hands in his face. Okay. Are you sure that he didn't put his hands to his face until you began to approach him? That's possible. Okay. Isn't it true that he didn't put his hands up until up to his face until you said to him, remember me? No. You ever tell anybody that? Not to my recollection. Did you tell Bill Hodgman that in Chicago? As I stated, not to my recollection. And the cut that you saw on the defendant's finger that day? Yes. You say there was a bandage on that cut? Yes. And the bandage was loose, wasn't it? Yes. And the bandage was so loose that you could see the cut? Correct, I could see him. Do you know whether or not the defendant left the bandage loose so that you could see the cut? I would have no idea. It does. Okay. Were you surprised that the defendant had a cut on his finger? Yes. And were you surprised that the bandage on the finger was loose as opposed to being tightly wrapped around the cut? I actually didn't think about that. I was more surprised that Mr. Simpson was sitting outside there because I knew he was supposed to be asleep. The bandage that you saw was not a Band-Aid, is that correct? I thought it was a Band-Aid. Uh, you, you testified a little while ago about having seen gauze on his finger. Is that correct? Yes, I did. I meant the inside part of the Band-Aid, the gauze part of a regular Band-Aid. Okay. And how big was that Band-Aid? I thought fairly large. And what is fairly large? About like that. Show me again. About like that. In fact, I thought that it possibly could be two. I remember thinking that because I thought it was, you know, like one of the very large size so the band -aid. bandages. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You finished? He made a gesture that I was not able to see. Can you give me an estimate? About an Show inch and a half. Okay. Thank you. Now, at some point you saw the defendant fumble around uh, with his bag, the black leather bag. Is that correct? That is correct. And where was the defendant at that time? Sitting on the bench. And you could see inside that bag, couldn't you? Yes, I could. Have you spoken to Mr. Merrill about his observations of the contents of that black leather duffel bag? No. Okay. By the way, does this look like the bag to you? That's very similar. Okay. Um, defendant, it's uh, 1064, Your Honor. Yes, thank you. Okay. The bag uh, was not full, was it? No. In fact, the bag was relatively empty, wasn't it? Yes. And that surprised you, didn't it? Yes. Do you know what happened to the contents of the bag? No. Objection. Okay. Speculation? Okay. Yes. Well, you did talk to Mr. Merrill about his observations of the contents of the bag when he picked the defendant up at the airport. Is that correct? Objection, Your Honor. Oh. Rephrase the question. Okay. Well, did you talk to Mr. Merrill or have you ever spoken to Mr. Merrill about his observations of the contents of that black bag? No, not the contents. Have you spoken to him on the issue of whether or not the bag appeared full to him when he picked up the defendant at the airport? No. Have you spoken to Mr. Merrill about the weight of the black uh, duffel bag at the time that he uh, picked the defendant up at the airport? don't recall. At any event, when you looked inside the bag that morning, the bag appeared empty. Is that right? Sustain or phrase question. It was empty for the most part. Is that right? Okay. Well, how empty or how full was it? There were, there were several items in there, but it, for the most part, was empty. Okay. Now, The defendant got into your car, is that right? That's correct. And you took him to the airport? Yes. And uh, on the way to the airport, were you able to observe his ankles and his feet? No. Did you ever look at the defendant's ankles? Yes. Was he wearing socks? No, he was not. <laughs> he was not wearing socks? No. And the color of his shoes, what color were the shoes? Black. They weren't tan? Not to my recollection. Were the shoes boots? No, they were not. 
They were loafers? Loafers. They appear to be Italian loafers? They appeared to be. And when you arrived at the airport, the defendant got out of, out of your vehicle, is that right? Yes. Did you know that the, the defendant has, has arthritis? I did not know at the time. Was there anything about the defendant's demeanor that day that caused you to think that he had arthritis? No. Other than the cut that you saw on his finger, did he appear to be suffering from any physical disability that you saw at that time? No. What did the defendant do after he got out of your vehicle? I handed him his bags told him what gate to go to, and he left, went through the, uh, the doors to his gate. Okay. And when he left uh, your vehicle, he didn't walk, did he? He walked, but it was swiftly. Didn't he run? No, he did not. You were interviewed by a defense investigator, is that right? Yes. Have you seen that statement? I've seen the statement that was given to LaFall embarrassed. Didn't you tell that defense investigator that the defendant ran into the airport? No. Let me show you a uh, copy of a document. It's two pages. Do oh, you see your name on that document? Yes, I do. Okay, and that's uh, Raymond David Kilduff? That's correct. And uh, it has your birth date and social security number and stuff like that? Correct. Is this a statement that was shown to you last night? Um, actually, not last night. I received it probably a week ago. Okay, and you read Friday, it? Friday. I got it Friday. Okay, and you read that one week ago? Friday, I read it. Okay. If I could direct your attention to the next page. Okay. Would you take a look at the last sentence uh, of the statement that is uh, attributed to you in this document? I see it. Okay. Doesn't that statement state that you told the defense investigator that the defendant got out of your vehicle and ran into the airport? That's what that says. That's not what happened, though walked quickly. He did not run. Well, when you received this document a week ago, did you notify the prosecution that there was an error in this statement? No, I did not. Anything else? Thank you, sir. After uh, your two interviews with the police from Chicago and Los Angeles, were you ever notified that you would be called as a witness for the prosecution in this case? No. You're here under subpoena? Yes. And you're here because you have been required to and have told the truth in your testimony? Objection yes. Leading, Your Honor. Oh. How sure are you that on June the 13th, 
on the way to the airport that you saw our client, Mr. Simpson, in your vehicle and that he had a finger that was bandaged and that blood was coming through? Objection compound and it's leading. Oh, you can answer the question. The way the question was stated, it wasn't in my vehicle when he was outside. I saw it, and there's no doubt in my mind that I saw it outside the O'Hare Plaza. Thank you very much. Nothing further. Thank you for coming all this way. That's two questions, Your Honor. Mr. Kildow, it wasn't the cut on the defendant's finger that drew your attention, was it? No, it was the blood on the bandage. Thank you. All right, Mr. Kilduff, thank you very much, sir. You're excused. All right, Deputy Long, why don't you grab the cup there? Jurors are trying to summon the bailiff that they have run out of another pin. That's a good sign, well, I noticed I think one of our jurors has six notebooks. Mr. Cochran, Mr. Darden, are we ready to proceed? Yes, we are, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Mark Partridge, if the court please. All right, Mr. Partridge, come forward, please. All right, please face the clerk. Put your right hand, please. You can tell them the judge's testimony you may give them across now to you before this court. To be true to what you can make them just true to what you got. Thank you. Please have a seat. You can stand and speak until your first and last name is clear to the record. Mark Partridge, P A R T R I D G E. All right, Mr. Partridge, you just sit back in the chair, pull the microphone close to you, please. Mr. Cochran. Thank you very kindly, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Partridge. Hello. And uh, can you speak right into that microphone for us? Yes. Now, Mr. Partridge, um, what is your occupation? I'm a lawyer. And um, how are you trained? What what school? What law school did you attend? I went to Harvard Law School. And uh, when did you graduate from Harvard Law School? 1981. And uh, what kind of law do you practice? I do trademark and copyright law. And where is your office? Uh, I'm in Chicago with the firm of Patasol McAuliffe. And you practice trademark law with that firm in Chicago? Yes, I do. Now, you've come to California to testify on this matter from Chicago, is that right? Yes. And you're testifying pursuant to a subpoena, have you? Uh, I've, I understand there's a subpoena. I've agreed to testify. All right, you've agreed to come forward, and, and you're here today according to that. Is that correct? Yes, sir. How long have you been in California? I came on Tuesday. Would you like to go home soon? <laughs> I would very much, yes. All right, let's see what we can do about that. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to the date of uh, June, Monday, June 13th of 1994. Remember that particular date? Yes. Did you have occasion to be on a flight from Chicago to Los Angeles, American Airlines Flight 1691? Yes, I did. And why were you on that particular flight? I was coming to Chicago for depositions in one of my cases. Coming to Chicago or coming? I'm sorry, coming to Los Angeles. You're not usually a witness, are you? No, I'm not. Usually on the other end, right? <laughs> yes. Not as much fun, is it? No. Right. <laughs> Matt, may I approach you, Your Honor? You may. Now, I want to, Your Honor, approach the American Airlines uh, uh, simulated uh, Super 80 jet airliner and ask to mark this as uh, defendant's next in order. 1247. This is the uh, chart regarding American Airlines flight. Was it 1691? Thank you, Ricardo. Um, I want to just have you. Have you ever seen this before? No, I have not. Can you just step down for just a second and see if you familiarize yourself with this? 
This purports to be, if I might indicate your honor, purports to be a Super 80 jet. Uh, this part here is first class in the front of the plane, your honor. This is right behind first class, what was called a bulkhead. And I want to direct your attention to this uh, diagram once you see it and ask you whether or not you can point out generally where your seats were, your seat was on that plane from Chicago to Los Angeles. I was in this seat. All right. I guess that's 9E. All right, and 9E is a window seat, is that correct? It was next to uh, an emergency exit door. All right. Do you see what purports to be an emergency exit door on this uh, defendant 1247? All right. And you recall that, is that correct? Yes. And on that flight, uh, what was the, do you know the name of the passenger who was in 9D? Yes, that was Mr. Simpson. That was the gentleman in this case over there, Mr. Orenthal James Simpson? Yes. All right. And he sat next to you, did he? Yes. All right. Excuse me. What time uh, approximately did this plane leave uh, Chicago to come uh, to Los Angeles? Approximately 9 in the morning. And uh, <coughs> did you get on the plane first or did Mr. Simpson get on the plane? I was on the plane first. That he came in and sat next to you? Uh, he came in after I had been seated a while, yes. Okay. And uh, you've already described for us you were at the right side bulkhead seat, is that correct? Yes. Now, when Mr. Simpson came on the plane, did you recognize who he was? Yes. Had you ever met him before that time? No, never. Can you describe uh, for this jury how Mr. Simpson appeared to you when you first saw him come in the plane and, and have a seat next to you? When I first saw him, he was uh, dressed in a blue jean outfit, right. um, stonewashed blue jean shirt and stonewashed uh, blue jean pants. And uh, he came back to the seat next to mine. He was there. Also, there was another woman who had the same seat assignment. And oh. so the two of them stood together uh, for some time before he took the seat and before it was sorted out who would have which seat. So as I understand it, there was some confusion as to who had that seat, 9D, uh, Simpson or the other lady. Yes, both of them apparently had the same seat assignment, and right. the stewardess uh, sorted that out after a few minutes. So it was worked out after a while, and then Mr. Simpson sat there, is that correct? Yes. All right, and what did you notice about him? What, how did he appear to you to be at that point? Well, at first he seemed to be upset. All right. And, and how did you, what about him made you believe that he was upset at that point. At, at that point, he seemed uh, rushed and a bit agitated. All right. At some point, did he take a seat? He did, yes. And as he sat down next to you, uh, describe for the jury how he appeared to you to be, your visual observations at that point. Well, he, he sat next to me. Uh, he had... Um, He sighed heavily and uh, look, looked up, closed his eyes. All right. And uh, to you, this appeared as though he was, he was upset at that point? That was my reaction, that he was upset about something. All right. Now, did the stewardess, uh, you know, when you take off on these planes, sometimes the stewardess sit in the seats and they sit backwards, kind of facing you? Yes. There was a jump seat just in front of where Mr. Simpson was sitting. All right, and was there a stewardess in that, in that seat just prior to the takeoff? Yes, there was. And did she say something to Mr. Simpson? Yes, she said uh, something to the effect of a uh, bad way to start the week. And did he respond? Yes, he did. All right, the fact that he responded will stand. Next okay. question. He did respond to that statement, is that yes, correct? Yes, he did. All right. And uh, did you see him at some point uh, make a request for, for something, some water? Yes, he asked for water. Right. Did the stewardess accommodate? Uh, yes, she was in the jump seat. She undid her seat belt and harness and, and got up and got him a glass of water. Okay, and then what happened after that? Uh, she got, also got him a, a, a bottle of water and he drank the water. She sat back down uh, and then then the flight was uh, in the process of taking off. All right. 
Now, you were sitting right next to him, and you had an opportunity to observe him during this time frame. Is that correct? Yes, I did. Now, at some point, the flight took off, and you're now in the air heading from Chicago to Los Angeles. Did you continue to have occasion to observe Mr. Orenthal James Simpson? Yes. You tell us what you observed as, as you had your occupied seat 9E, and he was in 9D. Well, the next thing that happened after the takeoff uh, was that he asked for the telephone, and the stewardess helped him get the uh, telephone that was, I believe it was in the seat behind uh, that I was sitting in. Because we were in the bulkhead, there was not a telephone there. So she helped him get the telephone from the seat back, and uh, he made a telephone call. All right, now, and you were sitting real close, and did you hear at least his part of the the telephone conversation? I could hear some of the telephone call. Okay. Now, did he make uh, more than one phone call during the course of the During flight? the course of the flight, he made uh, quite a few phone calls. Did you have occasion to look at Mr. Simpson's hands as you sat there next to him on this flight? I did see his hands, yes. Can you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what you observed, if anything, regarding his hands? you see any Band-Aids at any point? Um, well, initially, I saw that there was a cut on his, the knuckle of his left hand. All right, is that the, which, which you're pointing to the knuckle of the left hand, the, this middle finger that I'm holding up here? Yes, it was, it was the uh, knuckle of his uh, ring finger. Right, and you could observe that? I could see that, yes. Right. And did you see anything else with regard to that at that point? Well, at that point, no. All Later, right. I saw that it was wrapped in what appeared to me to be paper towel from the restroom. All right. The time you saw him, did you ever see a Band-Aid or a gauze or anything around that? No, only the paper towel. All right. Now, did you at some point say something to Mr. Simpson? After he made the first phone call um, and continued to sigh, uh, I said something to him, again, like, uh, well, sustain. I would, um, and offer to make an offer proof regarding this aspect of it. <clears throat> let, me, let me ask another question, foundationally. Did you make a statement to him with regard to what was happening in his life and what was happening to him at that point? I did make a statement to him, yes. And in that statement, uh, did you inquire about, yes. well, let me finish the question, inquire about what was happening with him? You can't yes. tell us the statement quite yet. So, Your Honor, may I ask one for it? Thank you. Let me see you decide how it's going. Thank you.
You made a statement to Mr. Simpson. Yes, I did. And without telling us what you said to him, uh, did he respond? And can you answer that yes or no? Yes, he did. And in his response, did that give you some idea what was what has ha what had happened in his life, or information he just received? Yes. All right. So then you then had an idea of what was going on in Mr. Simpson's life at that point. Is that right? Yes. And uh, with regard to his state of being upset or distressed, did that condition continue on as you moved westward toward, toward Los Angeles? Yes. Did you have further conversations with Mr. Simpson? Yes, I did. And did the subject matter of those conversations relate to someone who was very near and dear to him who had been killed or murdered? Yes. No subject matter. Sustained. Answer stricken. Proceed. All right. The subject matter of these conversations dealt with what was troubling Mr. Simpson. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Or will. And did that continue to occupy much of the conversation that you had with him on your flight west? Or will. You can yes, answer that. Yes, it did. All right. And how long was that flight coming west? Four hours, approximately. And during this period of time, did you see whether or not Mr. Simpson drank any of, any of the water that he was given at the outset and any additional water? Yes, he drank water throughout the flight. And uh, do you have an estimate of how much water you drank? Probably a, a small Avian bottle, and he may have had a second. All right, maybe possibly two? Yes. Did you see him go to the restroom during any of this time frame? Yes, he went to the restroom two or three times. Did the subject matter of any children that Mr. Simpson... Let me finish the question. Sustain. Can't finish it? Sustain. Did Mr. Simpson continue to appear stressed and distraught as you described? Yes, he did. And can you describe or give the jury a word picture as you watched him sitting next to him of how he appeared to you to be without giving us any conversation? Well, as I said, he sighed heavily several times. Uh, he made a number of phone calls, as I said. Uh, it seemed to me he was trying to get information about Sustain. Next well, question. Did in the course of these phone calls, you, you could hear at least his side of the conversation? Could you not? I could hear some of what he said. Yes. All right. And after these phone conversations, did you get an impression that um, additional information was coming to him based upon what you heard him say, without telling us what it is? Sustain. All right. In the course of your conversation with Mr. Simpson. Did he tend to discuss with you greater details after these phone conversations? Oh, well. As the flight went on, I learned more details from the things he told me, yes. All right. And so after a while, without telling us what it was, you had an impression of what had taken place in this man's life. Yes. At that time. Oh, well. Now, did the subject matter, did you at some point tell him what your occupation was? No, I did not. I did well, it. let me correct that. He asked me, and I confirmed that I was a lawyer. All right. Were you acting like a lawyer, looking like a lawyer? Uh, perhaps. I, I had legal documents with me that I was working on. And uh, at some point, did you have occasion to give or loan Mr. Simpson a pen, fountain pen? I, I did, yes. He asked to borrow my pen. Did he, during this flight, strike that? Did the condition 
of his being upset and distressed continue during the flight? Yes, it did. Now, now you, you'd never met Mr. Simpson before that time, had you? No, I had not. You know that uh, one of his occupations, uh, profession has been he's an actor. You understand that, don't you? I understand that, yes. Did he appear to you to be acting as you observed him there? Oh, well, you give me an answer. No, I thought the way he was behaving was very sincere. Now, even though he appeared to be very distressed and upset, did someone approach him and ask him for an autograph? That you observed? Yes, during the flight, someone passed him a note asking for an autograph. And did he respond to that? Yes, he, he took the, the paper and gave the gentleman an autograph. What was the paper that we came on? I believe it was an airplane cocktail napkin. As he did that, did he still appear to you to be upset and distraught? Yes, that was consistent throughout. And did that trigger some kind of a thought in your mind when this happened? Yes, it did. I, I, I thought what a nice man this was to be doing this, having heard what I had heard about the tragedy that was affecting his life. At some point, you reached Los Angeles International Airport. Yes. Had the state of distress and distraughtness that you've talked to us about, had that remained throughout the entire flight? Yes, it was consistent through the flight, as I said. Did there come time for you all to get off that flight? Yes. And uh, do you recall whether or not uh, who, which of you got up first to leave that particular flight, 1691? He, he was up first and got ahead of, ahead of me in the queue leading out of the plane. And from, that, that, uh, from the queue leading out of the plane, did he at some point turn around and say something to you? Well, there were several people. Can I ask that yes or no? Yeah. Yes. And uh, could you see his lips as he was in front of you? Yes, I could see his lips. And did he thank you at that point for your help? He turned back, and what I could see him saying was, thank you. Did he then leave the plane? Yes, he did. And as he left that plane, uh, did you see him anymore that day? No, I did not. I presume you went on about your business that day, did you? I did, yes. And you didn't see him when he left at that point, right? No. As I said, he was uh, ahead of me in the line leading out of the plane, and I didn't see him when I was off the plane. Did you at some point, uh, just one second, Your Honor. Madam Reporter. Now, you described for us um, how the conversation went while you were on the plane, and the information that you gathered over the period of the flight. And you've told us that you're a lawyer. Yes. And based upon those kinds of things, did you at some point uh, feel that you should give Mr. Simpson some advice? You can answer that yes or no. Yes. And uh, did you at some point give him some advice? Yes. And what? Advice, if any, did you give him? Sustain. Well, I'd like to be heard on that, Your Honor. I think um, I could phrase it another way, but I'd like to. I'd like the court to hear a, a brief offer regarding that. All right. Well, we're going to take a ten-minute recess at this point. In any event, All right. I'll hear you over the sidebar. Yeah, sure. All right, Mr. Partridge, you can step down. Come back in ten minutes. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're just going to take a brief comfort break. Ten minutes, and we'll be back in session. All right. Let me see counsel. And Ronald Goldman, correct? That's not completely correct. No, I didn't. No? You were not observing him closely because you knew about the murders? Sustain, rephrase the question. You made very careful observations of Mr. Simpson's conduct, is that correct? 
I would say reasonably so, yes. And of his physical condition, correct? Yes. And you were doing so at least in part because you had learned of, of the murders of Ronald Goldman and Nicole Brown, Same correct? Same objection. Right. That I can't answer that yes or no. It's not completely correct. It's partially correct. It's partially correct. Yes. That was part of the reason you were observing him very closely. Correct? Partially so, yes. By that I mean some of that I knew and some of that I didn't know. You knew that something big had happened, correct? I knew that his ex-wife was dead uh, initially, that, and during the course of the flight, I learned that she had been killed. And toward the end of the flight, I learned that a, another person, a man, had been killed as well. And so you learned early in the flight that his ex-wife was dead, correct? Yes. And that fact, knowing it, and you knew it was a recent event, is that right? Yes, I understood it had just happened. And that caused you to pay very close attention to his physical condition and his, and his demeanor, correct? It caused me to pay attention to him, but mostly what it caused me to do is be, I don't know, concerned about the situation. And that concern caused you to observe him very closely, correct? As I said, reasonably so, yes. And you observed at that time, because you were observing him closely, that there was a cut on the middle finger of his left hand. Is that right? I, I remember that it was a, a cut on the knuckles of his left hand. And, and I recall that it was the, the ring finger or middle finger. And there was no bandage on that finger at the first time you saw it, correct? I, I'm sorry, I said ring finger, I'm getting mixed up here. Middle. I mean middle finger, right. yes. And there was no bandage on that finger the first time you saw it, correct? The first time I noticed that there was no bandage. That's right. And it was not bleeding, was it? It was not, I didn't see any blood, no. Later, you saw him wrap it in a paper towel, correct? Yes. So at the first observation of it, it was not bleeding, and then later on, it seemed to be bleeding, is that right? I never saw any blood. Didn't you tell the police that you saw blood seeping through the paper towel after he'd wrapped it with a paper towel? No, I never said I saw blood seeping through a paper towel. Let me show you a copy of your statement, sir. All right, sir, I'm showing you a form that says statement form on it. Do you see your name in the upper left-hand corner? Yes, I do. Mark Partridge? Yes. Date of interview, October 6, 1994? Yes. Now I'm going to direct your attention to the page that contains the narrative and show you this paragraph that I'm pointing to here. I previously shown to counsel. Yes. Do you see the statement there? Yes. And does that statement indicate that you told Detective Crossley that the defendant had wrapped a paper towel from the restroom around the finger because blood was leaking out? I don't know that that statement indicates that that's what I said. That's what is stated here. You have no recollection of ever saying that? No, I didn't say that. Then is it your testimony that you never saw that finger bleeding on June the 13th? I never saw any blood, that's right. I saw that the finger was cut and somewhat raw, but I didn't see any blood coming from it. Did you see whether there was more than one cut on that finger? It looked, looked to be kind of a jagged, raw cut. I couldn't really say if it was more than one or if it was just a rough cut that was as opposed to a sharp, straight cut. So you could not tell whether it was more than one cut? Yes or as no? As I recall it, it's as I described. I could not tell if it was more than one cut. Thank you. 
And if it was more than one cut, you could not tell whether both cuts were received at the same time, correct? That's certainly correct. And the notes that we're speaking of, you gave those notes to the defense first, is that right? Yes, I did. You did not give those notes to the prosecution until Detective Crotsley contacted you in October, is that right? Uh, yes, I gave them to the prosecution after I was contacted by Officer Crotsley. In fact, that wasn't until December of 1994, isn't that right, sir? I sent them to Officer Crotsley in early December, yes. Now, you indicated, sir, that someone asked the defendant for an autograph during the flight, is that right? Yes. And he gave it to them, didn't he? Yes. And you indicate that the defendant drank water throughout the flight? Yes. And that one of the first things he did when he got on the plane was ask for water, is that right? That was one of the first things, yes. And then after the plane took off, he immediately requested a telephone, is that right? Yes, that's right. And the first phone call he made, could you hear who he made that phone call to? Sidebar, please. All right, thank you, counsel. Proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. And you indicate that after the plane took off, he immediately requested a telephone, correct? Yes, that's right. The stewardess brought him one, did she not? Yes, she did. And the first call he made, you were able to hear who he was speaking to, didn't you? I heard a name, yes. And that name was? I wasn't able to hear. I, I heard a name. And the name was? Skip. And approximately how long did he speak to this person named Skip? That particular call was quite brief. I would say a minute. Okay. <clears throat> and I take it you've somewhat followed this case, have you not, sir? Somewhat, yes. Have you heard the name of an attorney named Skip Taft? I have heard that name. And have you learned whether or not he was the defendant's attorney? Objection. Sustained. Do you know? Do you know whether he was the defendant's attorney back in June 13th of 1994? I, I don't know. I have an understanding. And what is that understanding? My sir? understanding. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. That's Sustain. How many calls on that flight did you hear 
the defendant make to someone named Skip? I only remember the name once. But he did, did mention at one point that he'd been trying to reach his office and his lawyer and his mother and his house. Sustained. All right, next question. Sorry. You're, you're a lawyer, aren't you, Mr. Clarkbridge? Yes. You ever tried cases, Mr. Clarkbridge? I have. Overruled. I, I have, yes. You know the rules of evidence, don't you, sir? Objective. Overruled. Don't you? I try to know them. You know what a non-responsive answer is, don't you, sir? Objective. Yes. Overruled. And you know what, but if there's no question pending, you're not supposed to be offering any answers. Isn't that correct, sir? Yes. Now, you offered us the opinion, sir, that the defendant did not appear to you to be acting, correct? You recall that? Yes. You'd never met him before the date of June the 13th, isn't that right? That's right. You never visited his home in Rockingham? No. You never met his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, did you? No. You never met Ron Goldman, did you? No. Counsel, these questions aren't necessary. He's established his first acquaintanceship with him was on the plane. You're not a psychiatrist, are you? We don't know, not likely. Proceed. No. You don't know what the defendant's relationship was with his ex-wife, do you? Sustain. Sustain. But you do know the defendant is an actor, correct? I understand that he is sometimes an actor, yes. And you knew that on June the 13th when you were on the flight with him, did you not? I don't think I did know that. You did not know he was an actor at that time? I, I only knew that uh, from the uh, Hertz commercials. You had not seen any movies he'd been in? I don't think so. And based on that flight that you took on June the 13th, your only contact with him, you think that you can offer us a competent opinion as to whether or not he was acting Objection. on that date? Sustain. Now, sir, you told us about these detailed notes that you took of eight handwritten pages, correct? I you recall? I did say that I took notes, yes. And you just told us, I believe, a few questions ago that you only recall one phone call made to Skip by the defendant. Is that right? I only recall the name once, I think, uh, yes. Okay, I'm going to show you page six of your notes. Okay. See if that refreshes your memory as to whether or not there was one call or more than one call to this person named Skip. Okay. Yes, it does. And how does that, how does that refresh your recollection? Well, these sir? are my notes taken at, made at the shortly after, and I refer to more than one call from someone named Skip. So, yes, there was more than one call. More than one, sir? Isn't it true in your notes that you say several says, times? Yes, several. Given the fact that June the 13th was the only time you'd ever seen the defendant, I gather then that you will, you have never seen the defendant when he's angry. Sustain. Goes to foundation, Your Honor. We've established this is the first time he's seen him. All right, you have nothing to compare his conduct on June the 13th to. Is that correct? No prior conduct on his part. No, that's correct. Nor since. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you spoke, sir, on direct of the tragedy that affected his life on that day? Yes. You recall that? Yes. 
Did you reflect also on the tragedy that affected the life of Ron Goldman or his family? Sustain. Sustain. I'd like to mark the uh, printout of the uh, witnesses' copyright, People's Next in Order 506. 506. I have nothing further. Mr. Cochran. Now, uh, may I approach, Your Honor, um, Mr. Partridge? Yes, you may. All right. Mr. Partridge, I'd like to approach, and I'd like to show you the eight pages of the handwritten notes which you made on June 15th, 1994. And I'd like to ask you whether or not uh, those notes uh, reflect your handwriting. Yes, they do. And uh, since we're not copyright lawyers in this courtroom, would you tell us what is the effect of your writing this little C in 1994, M. Partridge, all rights observed? My intent was to prevent other people from copying these notes without my permission. Well, I was sending them off to people and I didn't want them released to the media or anyone else without my consent. And as a trademark or copyright lawyer, you knew how to protect those particular notes, isn't that correct? This was one of the things that one can do. Right. And that's why I did it. And you've never tried to sell those notes, have you? No. In fact, you were one of the few people in this case who's tried to protect their notes, isn't Objection. it? Well, that's correct. Let me rephrase that. In fact, as a trademark copyright lawyer, you knew how to protect those notes, right? I knew this was one thing I could do to try to prevent them from being copied without my consent. And although you had occasion to send these notes to Detective Crossley, I think you said in December of 1994, you had called the prosecution in this case first. Isn't that correct? I'd called the police first. All right, the police agencies. Yes. All right. Now, a few other questions, if I might. Are you aware that um, the person, Skip Taft, that uh, Mrs. Clark was asking you about was Mr. Simpson's longtime friend and business lawyer of 20 plus years? Are you aware of that? I'm not aware of that. You're still not aware of that, are you? No. You're aware that they share office space together? No. You're aware they own property together? No. Now, Ms. Clark, in response to the fact that you called the Santa Monica Police Department on the Friday after your flight, and then you then were directed to the LA Police Department, asked you some questions about whether you knew how many people might be interviewed by the Los Angeles Police Department. Remember those questions? Yes. Suppose that with regard to all of the people who were interviewed by the Los Angeles Police Department, you were the only person in the world who sat next to him on the flight back from Chicago, isn't that correct? Oh. Well, suppose, sounds like a hypothetical question. No, you want to ask well, a direct me, question? Let me rephrase that. Were you the only person in the world, let me just get closer, Your Honor. Were you the only person in the world to sit in seat 9E on flight 1691 on June 13, 1994, from Chicago to Los Angeles on American Airlines when O.J. Simpson sat in seat 9D? Yes, I am. Thank you. I just wanted to ask one question. And when you sat in that seat, sir, did you happen to observe, you said you observed what the defendant was wearing. Did you also observe what he had on his feet? Yes. It is sustained. May I ask to take my witness for this one question? One question. One question. Tell us what he was wearing on his feet, sir. He had um, black leather loafers. What kind? One question. That's two. That's two. What kind? They were um, sort of woven black leather loafers. Thank the you. the leather was woven. Socks. Yeah, that's, three. Nope. that's yeah. three. That's three. That's three. The 
will never end. No, it will. That, that's all I wanted to ask. I thought we asked this already of this witness. No. Objection. Sure. Last question, Your Honor. Objection. Honest. The last it's beyond, question it's beyond the scope. I've allowed you to go beyond. We've established what he's had on his feet. All right, Mr. Uh, Partridge, thank you very much, sir. You're excused. Thank you. Next witness. Yes. All right, thank you, Council. Ladies and gentlemen, we were scheduled to uh, go through to 545 today, and rather than start a new long witness, I think we'll take a break at this point rather than have to start up again tomorrow morning. Remember all my admonitions to you, however. Don't discuss the case amongst yourselves. Don't form any opinions about the case. Don't conduct any deliberations until the matter has been submitted to you. Do not allow anybody to communicate with you with regard to the case. All right, you all have a pleasant evening. See you bright and early tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock.